Travel and things in association with rugged wear, real people, real clothing, real solutions presents in conversation with. I am your host, David Batsoffen, and my guest today is the author of this unbelievably interesting book, An Ecological Guide to the Bush by Dr. Bruce McKenzie. Um, Dr. McKenzie, may I call you Bruce? Of course. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. This is such a magical book. It really and truly is. Well, uh, thanks for, for that compliment. I, I hope the inside is better, is all better than the cover. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, a totally different take on on wildlife books that, that we're used to. The book, uh, by the way, is produced is um, published by Jakarta. Um, and well done for them. It's well put together. But you seem to have taken a little bit of a, I don't want to say left a field view of ecology, but it's not your usual pictures of animals and then, you know, zebras eat grass and what type of grass they eat. You've, you've taken a little bit of a different uh, perspective. I mean, look at those animal drawings. That's not something you normally find. <laughs> No, you, you're quite right. And uh, basically, the the book came about when, uh, both from my 40 years of experience of lecturing, and really based on, I suppose, the questions that the students didn't ask, rather than the <laughs> students' the questions that they did ask, and then spending a lot of time with what I call, um, you know, ordinary people in the bush. Right. And um, what I wanted to do was to get them to understand the ecosystem a bit more. Okay. And in that sense, I, I used the energy component and traced the energy through the ecosystem, but using uh, plants and animals and examples that you can see from your car. So yeah, that's what I tried to do. And basically, the idea is that people learn a little bit more about the bushveld than just the big five. Well, this is it. You know, I, I think you're right there, Bruce. And I think people are moving away from the big five. Um, I think that was a marketing ploy. It's still a marketing ploy because people, when they go to a lodge, that's what they want to see. And they forget about the little bits and bobs. Um, as a fellow in the Kruger National Park many years ago, I used to call them the Hohakis and Nunakis that ran around the bush folk. But when I got your book, um, I was sitting having coffee with, to write while I was having coffee with some friends. And um, there is a, um, what do you call it? A, an equation in the book, which is uh, C2H12O6 plus 6O2 equals 6CO2 plus 6H2O um, plus energy. And I put it out there to the table, and I, I got such a lively discussion out of just that. People going, but now hang on a second, this is alcohol, or it's alcohol-based. I'm going, no, it's not alcohol. It's got nothing to do with alcohol. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's interesting. And I think that was one of the challenges I had, is not to put too many equations in. Yeah. Um, because what I was trying to produce, I think, was a, a, a hybrid of a book that would be useful to certainly beginning undergraduate students and people maybe who are interested in nature conservation, uh, but yet not too scientific that I uh, hope that the ordinary regular uh, visitor to the bush felt can have a different perspective mm. during those quiet times when they're at the camp or um, at a water hole and nothing's much is happening instead of... Um, looking through a tree book at all the different species <laughs> that can actually read one of these chapters and get an understanding of the energy flow. Yeah. Of, of why the tree is there, basically. Basically, I suppose, yeah. yeah. But it, it almost reads like a novel because it's that it's that interesting. And, and you've just said it because I was going to ask you what your demographic was for the book, and you've answered that question already. Um, but it's exactly that. You can sit anywhere, um, pick it up, and you can just choose a chapter. It's one of those wonderful, I call them toilet reads, where you can have it in, in the toilet. Yeah. You've got nothing else to do. Put your phone down. You don't need to look at Facebook constantly. You pick up something like this, and you can actually learn something while you, 
doing something, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think you're quite right. You know, one of the uh, once the book came out, I said to myself when I looked at some of the chapters, they're quite short. And I thought, gee, you know, um, surely I could have added some more, another two or three pages um, to that particular chapter. But then in, in discussion and sort of reviewing it myself, I said, well, you actually want to keep it really, really short. So you can look at an individual chapter uh, reasonably uh, quickly mm. and, um, and hopefully it's readable. And uh, you can learn, learn a lot quite quickly. Yeah. So yes, I, I, to get back to your original thing, the idea is that I wanted it to be a journey, mm. a journey through the ecosystem, and for that it needs to be readable. And I, yeah. I hope I've achieved that. No, I think I think you have it in spades. What was the was it a, a long deadline from Jakarta, or did you sort of pitch the idea and they said yes? Can we have it tomorrow? <laughs> Um, I well, uh, Jacona uh, jumped on the on board very quickly when I presented to them. I suppose that's sure, maybe just a little bit over a year ago. Mm. Um, and um, we had to uh, jump through a few hoops to get the thing going, but um, they were enthusiastic uh, about it from the word go when I first approached them. So, I suppose. Uh, when I first approached them a year or so ago, I still had a lot of my own editing to do, never mind their <laughs> editing. <laughs> so uh, it, it was, um, it, it moved quite quickly, I, I'd say. I'm, I'm not sure how long it takes to do these things. but uh, what, What's it like for somebody like, you, you're, you've already written your doctorate, so you, you've been immersed in academia. Um, yeah. When it comes to a book like this, yeah. where you you know what you want in it, and then you get back those pages with the red editorial going, can you take this out or can you change that or can you extend that? And do you go and sit in a corner and have a quiet cry and go, no, I'm not going to do this. And then thought to yourself, well, if I want this thing published, maybe I should take out the and and replace it with a the type of thing. Well, the, the, I suppose the short answer to that is I, I left all that sort of thing to to the uh, Jakarta um, okay. editors and proofreaders. But uh, just to give you an example, one of the the you'll you'll note that all the um, illustrations are black and white. Yeah, and that was done primarily, I think, for two reasons. I I focus on shape and size in mm. the in in the book. And I think it stands out better uh, mm. in black and white rather than in uh, in color. Yeah. And it also reduces the price. Um, so, for example, uh, example getting back to Jakarta, they did sort of say, "Well, gee, shouldn't we have some color pictures in the center or so?" So there wasn't any uh, um, uh, really much debate about it it was just a discussion and once i'd explained what i was trying to do mm. um they jumped on board and concentrated on my language <laughs> <laughs> yeah putting it through word check or, or spell yeah. check and grammarly or something like that there's still words that slip through um no absolutely yeah. have you had people read the book and then get hold of your friends and go you know that on page 63, there's a spelling mistake. Um, I've had people that have go, go through the book, but the, the, the people that really helped me and criticized it initially were really looking at drafts. Mm. So <clears throat> the, the, the book only came out the, from the uh, printers uh, less than a week ago. So <laughs> I, <laughs> You I, haven't had time my, to have real complaints. Yeah. I haven't had time to... to um, I give it to I, 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 two or three people that I do know have actually read it and mm -hmm. um, have given me some comments, um, but not specific. Um, do you know that you spelt this incorrectly? <laughs> <laughs> what did you know? I mean, this book, as I say, it reads like it could be a novel because of the way you uh, disseminate your information, which is easily read and it's easily absorbed. 
did you get to a point where you knew that you had to type the end and send it off to Jakarta and go, that's it, guys, I'm done. I'm going on holiday and turning my cell phone off. Or did you have trouble letting go, Bruce? Um, well, let me say this. Uh, being an ecologist and a, a lecturer all my life, you never stop learning. <laughs> yeah. And you uh, these days, and I think one of the challenges I had was that there's so many specialists out there, whether it's on insects or birds or whatever, uh, any one individual can never um, be on top of all of that. And even when you think you've finished it, you suddenly mm -hmm. look up something and say, my goodness, you know, I, I didn't know that. Or, hey, maybe I could have used that example instead yeah. of this one. So, um, yes, but I was comfortable when I, I, I had reached a point where I felt it was, it was complete enough to get my message across. Okay. Ta take me back, if you would. If I was to meet you as a young Bruce McKenzie, yes. um, 17 year old, you're in matric, you've got your life ahead of you. What would I have learned from you? Would I have, would I, would the young Bruce McKenzie at 17 know his career path? Or did you follow sort of convoluted trail to get where, to where you are today? Um, I didn't know my career path. I, I certainly knew that I wanted to work outdoors. Um, and having grown up in a farm environment, um, that's just what I wanted to do, either in forestry or in a game reserve or something mm. along those lines. Um, but really, the, the major uh, change in my life was actually after I finished my BSc and, you know, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And then uh, my professor said, well, why don't you do honours? I said, you know, honours? I mean, I didn't even think of that. And that was really, so I suppose that was when I was about 23, 24, when I really sort of took off and um, I became a lecturer, which sort of happens by default rather than design, you know. And then I, 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 I loved working with young people. So that's what encouraged me to, to continue and I suppose eventually produce this book. <laughs> I, I always wonder about people who follow a teaching career path, having known how badly they treated their teachers <laughs> through their school career, or maybe even into varsity, yet they're, they're willing to stand up in front of a class and put themselves at the same risk um, of being, you know, ridiculed perhaps or not respected enough and go back and do it day after day, week after week, year after year sometimes, um, hoping to get a message across to, to modern day students who seem to be there only because there's nowhere else to go. You know, they have to stay there until the pub opens or something. <laughs> yeah, I look. Uh, 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 lecturing in in front of a big class is challenging, but uh, and I think my real success of dealing with young people is when they <clears throat> there were fewer of them when they came through to the honors level. Yeah, um, and and then I could interact with them and give them confidence and so on. That was my. I, I'd like to think is was my strong point mm. was um, in, in lecturing was encouraging people and giving them the confidence uh, to go ahead and go elsewhere to get a better education in the biological sense than maybe I could some other more well known professor could. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I didn't need to keep my students. I just wanted to give them the the encouragement to yeah. to. To pursue their career. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce, in the beginning of this book, you acknowledged three men. Mm. Um, would you care to share those with the viewers as to who they were and why they were important in your life? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And um, you know, the, the those are three people who've passed on. Uh, um, uh, my cousin, who was my best friend. Um, shared most of my experiences in the bush with me from a young age. Um, 
And he particularly was interested in, in encouraging me when I said I, uh, or, or he said to me rather, won't you provide me with some ecological um, notes for mm -hmm. the bush? And initially, I suppose that's how the book started in a way. I produced Ronio notes for him. And then <laughs> from there, that continued with the encouragement of um, uh, Professor Eugene Moll yeah. to take it further into a book. And the other two gentlemen were were just legendaries in the conservation field. Uh, Jim Feely um, you know, worked with me in, in at the University of Transkei for about five years, a good 20 years or so my senior. And um, just being in the bush with him, I learned so much about uh, ecology mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and the role of humans in that. And the same applies to... Uh, Garth Owen Smith, who worked mainly in, in Namibia, I uh, spent less time in the bush with him, but just being with him in the bush and his demeanor and his vision, or both of their visions for for conservation and involving people were, um, were immense and really, uh, when I look back at it, influenced uh, my way of thinking and teaching. And um, cer certainly they did contribute to uh, the philosophy that I adopted in the book. You you mentioned your cousin, but you didn't mention his name. It was Sam McKenzie. Oh, sorry. But, but why is, Jack? Uh... <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, everybody asks us that. They always asked us that. And, um, you know... You don't want to hear these sort of simple stories, but it really comes back, I think, when we were just after we left school and we um, probably after we visited the pub or something, we started to sing this Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, uh, Jack okay. jump, candlestick. And then from then on, it just became Jack. <laughs> <laughs> probably not of much interest to others, but to us, it was a uh, um, no, part of our story. <laughs> look, it's, 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 it's part of what the book is all about. It's, it's part mm. of the tapestry the fabric of your life um and yeah, if you put yeah. jack in inverted commas you know you're going to engender questions from somebody <laughs> um are yeah. there are there questions from the students that that have made it into the book or that have helped you formulate parts of this book where you've gone wow i didn't see that coming um or it's so ridiculous that i've got to put it in because nobody will believe it type of thing, if you know what i'm getting <laughs> at yeah, I, I I think um to answer that question, yes. Uh as I said right at the beginning, it was sometimes more the the, the not questions asked. That you didn't ask. Um you know, I lectured mainly in what are called the um so called disadvantaged universities in South Africa, and uh, most of the students were used to rote learning. So they almost expected to have to recall page one to mm. 20. Um, and what I kept on emphasizing is <clears throat> trying to get people to think out of the box. Yeah. And that's quite difficult in a, in a large class. And I think I mentioned earlier that you, you can actually interrogate students and get information from them in in smaller groups and possibly just uh, almost when they graduate rather than when they start their yeah. uh, their career um but yeah i try i, I try to include uh, in in the book the um the the other thing would happen i think just to, in, in relation to students is that often the curriculum you you they would talk birds separately and insects separately and mammals separately, and trying to get students to actually link them all up, which is also what I've tried to do in this book, is, is talk about the energy flow through the ecosystem, which in, includes it. So it, it was difficult sometimes to get to students to say, no, no, man, we did birds last, <laughs> uh, last semester, and why are you telling us about birds again? Yeah, or, but you yeah. see, you, you, you bring it up in the book, and I've never thought of this, or not consciously anyway, is the, the energy that birds use to fly. 
And how do they yes. replenish that energy? They can't pop off down to the garage cafe and go and buy an Energade or something like that. So where do they replenish it from? And it's questions like that that fascinate me um, as somebody involved in wildlife because it's not something that's front of mind. And it's the same yes. with the same with mammals. How much nutrition do they really get out of the grass that they're eating? You know, and zebras always look fat and it's not because they're <laughs> well fed, you know. No. It's just because the way that they their stomachs work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's I I, I think is, is is sort of the overall theme of the book the way you express it and uh, you know just to give you one probably a, a simple example of how I, I hope people think differently is you know most of my friends that come back from the bush and I say well how was the bush and they say no we saw this and that and that and I said well you know so what what did you learn mm -hmm. uh, what about um, energy. And I said, what are you talking about? The energies, uh, we're back with the energy problem now. We're back at load shedding. <laughs> and then I said, do you know that uh, plants that you drove past in the in the bush, they have load shedding 12 hours a day for their whole lives. <laughs> They're going to put that up. So yeah. just trying to get people to think differently. Uh, so I that's mean, obviously not in a book. Yeah. And there'll be but I hear people what you their own message. And... Uh, Come out with it, yeah. But you also, because you mentioned is why do lions sleep 20 hours a day? It's like recharging their batteries. Um, exactly. uh, for, for people in the bush, they get really excited when they see lions and then they realize they've been sitting at a sighting <laughs> for an hour and the things have done nothing. Exactly. And, and, and nothing's going to happen. Maybe roll over. Exactly. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the book is called An Ecological Guide to the Book. It's by Bruce uh, McKenzie. It's published by Jakana. It would make a great Christmas gift. And if you're not celebrating Christmas, something else perhaps. And if you're not celebrating, just go out and buy the book for yourself if it's of interest. You don't have to wait for somebody to, to gift you the thing. Um, is it available both online and in bookstores, Bruce? Um, I, I know Jacona have, have sent it to various bookstores. I haven't actually looked at all the detail of that yet. I've been so busy with a launch last Thursday. I've got another launch in Hoodsprake tomorrow night. So I've been concentrating on that rather than where exactly the book is at the moment. <laughs> if, if this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium type of thing. Or it must be Hoodsprake. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, it's Hoodsprake tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> but then I see, I, there, there's a question that I always like asking authors, and I'll ask it of you, um, but you can't really answer it yet which is if you were to walk into a bookstore and, and you see your book on the shelf, but instead of being like this, it's like that. Would yeah. you then go up and change it to that? And the other question is, you're, you don't feature on this book at all. There's no picture of you. So yeah. the other trick I know that authors sometimes do, because I've asked them, is if their faces on the cover or on the back, they will, will stand and go, oh, look, it's a new book by Bruce McKenzie. <laughs> and then go, I wonder what it's like, hoping that the people standing on either side of them will actually go, oh, but <laughs> you look very similar. Aren't you Bruce McKenzie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I suppose the, the um, uh, quick answer to your, your question there is, is uh, I suppose you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> <laughs> I have but to say... I, yeah. I have to say, Bruce, that in this industry, in the industry of ecology and wildlife and, and even guiding for that matter, um, the youngsters coming up walk on the shoulders of giants. And this book certainly puts you there as one of the giants. And thank you so much for taking the time and trouble to portray this type of thing um, to an audience that needs to know about it. They need to know why they have has to be grass why they have to be trees so that the animals that feast on those can survive as well. It's not just about saving the rhino, it's about saving their habitats as well. Thank Bruce, you very much for your compliments. Thank you so much. The book, once again, An Ecological Guide to the Bush, it's by Bruce McKenzie. It's published by Jakana and it is available now. Bruce, once again, thank you so much for your time and joining me here on In Conversation. Thank you very much.